So welcome everybody to today's webinar on navigating mental health, coping with vision, hearing and mobility loss in adult refsum disease. This is the first of four webinars we'll be presenting as part of this year's exciting Refsums Awareness Week. On the next slide, you'll see that uh, my name is Susan Karanoff. I am the co-founder and vice president of the Global Dare Foundation, and I'm happy to be your host today. We are very honored to have Dr. Ann Wagner, who is a board certified clinical psychologist with us and worked for 26 years on the post-traumatic stress disorder clinical team at the Minneapolis VA healthcare system. Now retired, she is professionally active as a consultant and guest speaker. Dr. Wagner's professional expertise is complemented by her personal experience living with RP which has rendered her legally blind. She's joined by Eric Ringham, who is a retired senior editor and works as a voice and stage actor. He brings a deep understanding of the power of storytelling and communication, both as a professional and as the spouse of Dr. Ann Wagner. On the next slide, you can see a little bit about the Global Dares Foundation mission. Um, Global DARE was founded um, exactly five years ago this month. DARE stands for Defeat Adult Refsum Everywhere. Our mission is to promote worldwide awareness and better quality of life for all of us who are impacted with adult refsum disease. Our goal is to support research, education, uh, initiatives, awareness campaigns and advocacy. Together with our medical and scientific advisory board, we're driving research as um, <clears throat> we believe that there is a cure for adult refsum disease. On the next slide, I'll just cover a few housekeeping details. So all of our participants are in listen mode only without video. You can type your questions in the Q&A box on the right hand side of the screen. It's not gonna be possible to unmute yourself to ask questions verbally. At the end of the presentation, I'll be moderating the questions for Eric and answer for Eric and Anne to answer. And uh, today's session is being recorded and it'll be available for later viewing on the Global Dare Foundation YouTube channel and website. On the next slide, I just wanted to remind you that during this Refsums Awareness Week, we have a great lineup of webinars. On Monday, you can hear an overview of the newly released Refsum Disease Clinical Guidelines. On Tuesday, we'll have two speakers present advances in Refsum research. And next Saturday, Christy and I will be talking about the progress we've made over the last five years as a young organization and what the future holds for us. Now, on the next slide, uh, I will be turning over to Anne and Eric to lead us through their discussion. Hello. Hi. Hi. So thank you, Susan and Christy, for inviting us to, to present. We feel, well, I feel honored. Um, and so uh, in my bio that Susan read, uh, I had worked 26 years at the Minneapolis VA. And even though I'm retired, I am required to say that the views I'm expressing today are my own and do not reflect any official views of my prior employer, the Minneapolis VA or the Department of Defense, um, Department of Veterans um, Services. So any, and, and I have no conflicts of interest to report as well. Um, anything else you wanna say, Eric? Uh, no, I'm a, um, as, as you heard in my bio, I'm a, I'm a retired senior editor, though that's uh, not a generic term, it's senior editor was my title at Minnesota Public Radio, which is the last place I worked. But most of my career I spent at the Minneapolis Star Tribune, uh, the big newspaper here hereabouts. Yeah, and he still does writing and, and other other things too. But but we are going to be talking today a little bit about mental health and vision loss. Um, I'm going to share some uh, like three main principles that I learned in my professional work that I also use personally every day that helps me cope and adapt to progressive vision loss. Um, and then Eric and I are gonna kind of go back and forth a bit and talk about some common dilemmas that can show up between people 
uh, with vision loss and they're the helpers or support people in their lives with common dilemmas and how to approach potential conflict areas. Um, so we, we look forward to feedback on if this was helpful or things you would have found more helpful. Uh, so I, I please feel free to email me. I, I, I believe in supporting communities uh, who have uh, low vision or their, their sighted support people. Um, so my email is Dr. Ann Wagner, all one word, D-R-A-N-N-W-A-G-N-E-R at gmail.com. Um, so to start off a little bit of my story, um, my mom has retinitis pigmentosa or had retinitis pigmentosa inherited from her father. And uh, she had a couple of brothers who also had it. Uh, what runs in our family is autosomal dominant recognized pigmentosa. So we know that one in 4,000 uh, people in the United States and one in 5,000 worldwide have a diagnosis of retinitis pigmentosa, but it's more of a classification name that covers all sorts of retinal dystrophies. So there's a 50 different genes, 100 different genetic loci. So it's kind of a mixed bag with the RP, but the general hallmarks are progressive night worsening night blindness and tunnel vision are pretty common among all of them. 20% of cases of RP um, are recessive transmissions. So you need both parents to have a recessive gene in order to inherit it or, or um, to become a carrier. Uh, autosomal dominant means if you have the condition yourself, any child you have has a 50-50 chance of inheriting it. If you don't have the RP, you will not pass it on. And then there are about 10% of cases that are X-linked uh, chromosomal transmission. The 50% the remaining are considered spontaneous or sporadic, just genetic mutations that happen. Um, spontaneously. So that's that's what I know scientifically about the transmission of RP. And I know that some uh, people have just what's called non-syndromal RP, which is what ran in my family, meaning no other bodily systems were effective, just the vision loss. And then there are syndromal RP, um, like Usher's uh, Bardet Beetle syndrome, BBS, and Refsum might be considered syndromal RP because other bodily systems are affected. And I think those tend to be much more rare. Um, so, just to give that background so, my, when you have autosomal dominant transmission, you have family members who have the condition. So, my mom and dad knew they wanted children. They had five children. We grew up on a farm. We worked that farm morning till night. My mom was blind. And so I grew up with this role model of somebody who never, never acted like she had a disability. She was a problem solver. Um, she was feisty and self-confident. And these five children, they had four of us inherited the RP. So our family was the most loaded with people knowing they were losing their vision. The sighted people in our lives, our friends and family knew that we needed well-lit areas. They knew our vision could change depending on the context. If there's a lot of shadows or glare, too much light could hurt our eyes. Um, they knew to, to offer an elbow in darker areas. And we learned to have dances, um, family dances at weddings or other gatherings with the lights on. So we all learned to be pretty unselfconscious with dancing. We can, doesn't matter what we look like, we're just gonna have fun because it helped us function. So I grew up in what I call a blind culture where I felt equal. I was treated with respect by my family um, and our family and friends. And we were sort of, and that was such a sense of safety and secure, security that helped internalize some, some healthy self-esteem. However, in the broader world, we have messages dominated by um, what's called the medical model of disability where Typical abilities are viewed as superior. We are people who have physical limitations or mental limitations are viewed as you need medical attention and treatment. Um, and um, the reason you're not able to function fully in the world is because you have this impairment. It's sort of localized within the individual. The social model of disability was developed by um, 
disability rights activists in the 1970s and 1980s, which is a more experienced truth-based approach that unfortunately the medical model is much more dominant. These messages that somehow we're less than because we have limitations, but the social model recognizes that disability is, is actually the disadvantages imposed on an individual by a society that views and treats impairments as abnormal and not worthy of inclusion. Um, it's the, the built world and people, the, the mental attitudes and beliefs that people have been programmed to have by the medical model is what is the barrier to full inclusiveness and being seen as fully equal in the world. So I had an experience because I blew up in this blind, grew up in this blind culture of what the social model really looks like when you are truly treated as equal and respected because the people around you understand and there's enough role models of people thriving even with blindness like my mom but the the rest of the world are my town and um, broader society i definitely experienced messages of because we're also very very poor very poor and farm families were not really valued so i had a lot of messages that i was different and not valued and bullied quite a bit but i had this safe secure place of community so even with that um so we're talking about mental health and vision loss in graduate school i sought therapy i like to be very transparent about that because i was struggling with social anxiety of feeling like because I wasn't going out to clubs dancing because I, if there's loud music, I couldn't hear, I couldn't see because of the night blindness. I simply wasn't having fun, so I didn't go. The rest of my friends were going and I felt left out and I was missing some of the connectedness and the friendships weren't deepening because I wasn't having shared memories. So anyway, I sought therapy to address that bit of anxiety. Um, and my, Several of my family members have also sought therapy. So I just wanna promote the idea of health and we're just inviting in experts when we seek therapy to help to be there with us to help. Um, so people with um, vision loss are in general, at, at least around uh, twice as likely to experience uh, depression as people without vision problems. But there are studies for people with retinitis pigmentosa that they are four to five times more likely than people without vision problems to experience anxiety or depression and four times more likely to experience both anxiety and depression uh, so we are kind of more at risk and i think for good reasons it's hard to live in a world where this medical model of messages are, are surrounding us, our own brains have absorbed some of those messages and programming and stigma. And then how can we not have some internalized senses of, of lower self-worth and how can that not feed anxiety and worry? And the adjustment itself takes so much sometimes. Um, so I'm not, I don't wanna paint a gloomy picture because the ultimate goal for everybody is adapting and thriving. And that's always within our grasp, but we also need to validate another universal experience, almost almost universal for people with any progressive medical condition is complex grief. So each progressive loss of vision can then ripples affect multiple areas of daily functioning. So not only are we then grieving, oh, I'm no longer able to see things that I used to be able to see because it's it's progressed, but now I'm noticing these areas of things I was independent, self-sufficient in doing. I now have to grieve that and the time that I now have to divert to seeking new resources, to grieving, um, maybe even finances. Uh, low vision equipment is very expensive and there are very few programs that provide it for free. Um, and so you're looking at time and energy. There are other activities we might want to be using with our free time when we're not working. Um, and instead, we have to now maybe reopen our, our case with um, most states here in the United States have a Department of Rehabilitation for low vision rehabilitation, where you learn all sorts of cool strategies. They orient you to technology and devices. 
Um, they can offer adjustment counseling, but that's not mental health therapy, but they are experts on like phases of adjustment um, that might be common. Um, so all those seeking out the time and the resources and the learning new skills and strategies um, takes time and energy. And I've talked to many people, I presented at many conferences related to low vision, and I just hear it can feel really exhausting even though people value resiliency and adapting, there are times where we need to just be with the grief. And it's not that we're giving up or in denial of the need to adapt, but we get to be with our core self and to, to be with our emotions and to validate them. And then there'll be other moments where we're, we're gearing up to, all right, I need to adapt. I need to figure out how to move forward. So the most common um, mental health issues are, tend to be anxiety, depression, the complex grief, and a bit of the internalized senses of, am I good enough, low self-worth related to, again, the messages um, that come from society and the medical model. But our truth is we already know who we are. Well, we have our core knows that we stand for what matters to us and our values. And we can, we can try to claim those and show up as we adjust. Um, but it may take a lot more time and energy than people who aren't um, dealing with progressive medical problems. So I want to talk a little bit about the like three main principles or ideas uh, that I, I learned in my professional training that I found so helpful. And I would I would weave them into evidence-based therapies that I would use at the VA, like prolonged exposure, treatment of PTSD, um, acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT, um, and, and many other approaches. But I, I'm, my earliest training was in brief psychodynamic approaches that really validate um, the attachment model and secure attachment and feeling safe and secure emotionally and what that means. So I'm heavily influenced by those kinds of principles. I think Diana Fosha, who developed accelerated experiential dynamic psychotherapy, does a beautiful job explaining some of those core kind of ideas and principles. But I'm also extremely um, influenced by narrative therapy developed by Michael White and David Epstein in kind of the early 1990s. So a lot of these, these three ideas are are consistent and supported by narrative therapy as well as like AEDP, um, just so you, you know what orientations I'm coming from, and ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy also supports some of these ideas. So the first one is this idea that emotions show up to tell us what we care about, our values, what matters to us, otherwise they don't show up. Yet we, societally, we have been programmed with messages that to feel or express our painful emotions means there's something wrong. How many people, when you're looking sad, say, what's wrong? It's right there, a message, I'm not supposed to feel what I feel because somehow it's wrong. And, and so, um, and people feel uncomfortable, like, because they care about us, they don't want us to be dis in distress. So they have their own urges to want to avoid their own discomfort because we've been programmed to try to avoid our own emotions. And yet when we can step back from all the languaging, all the messages and just be with ourselves, our core self is a term I like to use. We get to see something pretty phenomenal um, that these emotions are actually showing up to tell us about our own core of who we are. And we don't have to be afraid of them. We don't have to suppress them. Um, if we can feel secure within ourselves to fully experience them. So we need to be mindful of the role of judgments in human suffering um, because it's a fear of judgments, a fear of rejection, a fear of non-belongingness that has driven this need to suppress our own core emotions. Because if I'm a young person and I'm I'm trying... I'm feeling my natural core emotions and the messages are stop crying. There's nothing to cry about or, oh, be a big boy or a big girl. Um, and, and we're taught right there, that subtle message that if I don't do what the big people around me are telling me, if I don't somehow show that I'm not having those emotions, I'm risking rejection. 
And when we're very young, that can be a fear of almost like annihilation because we need connectedness to survive. So we learn how to find and keep the connectedness being offered to us. Like, okay, I'm going to suppress my core emotions. I'm going to somehow bury them because of fear of rejection and non-belongingness. So I can maintain the connectedness that is being offered to me. That's adaptive. And we're, I'm never going to judge these patterns of protecting ourselves um, through avoidance of our own core emotions because it's adaptive. We're trying to survive in this world. Everybody's been programmed with these messages that we're not supposed to feel what we feel. Um, but how can we show up to connect to our core selves and be as authentic and real as possible? Because that generally does feel the healthiest for us. So when I'm working with people in therapy or within my, myself, we want to connect to the core, um, what feels healthier healing for us. And our core usually knows what feels healthier healing and what feels self-validating when we connect to our core emotions. So emotions show up to tell us what we care about. So I'm going to give you an example. Grief. So we talk about complex grief is almost universally experienced. So each moment we realize we've had a, another vision loss or functioning then can have all this complexity of the meanings and the emotions that show up. So when I think about the fact that I cannot see my two-year-old grandson's face, two emotions show up, helplessness and grief. Helplessness emotion is so important and yet it's the one we struggle with the most because we like to feel in control. And we, it's, it's, we've really been programmed to struggle with that emotion. And yet if we can step back and look at what is the helplessness telling us about what we care about. For me in this example, it's telling two truths. Almost always it tells us two truths. The first truth is that I have zero control, zero control over anything except what I choose to say or do in this one moment. That's it. We cannot control the past or the future. We don't have time machines yet. We cannot control what other people say, what they do, what they feel, what they believe. We have no direct control. Emotions show up to tell us what we care about. We can't control them, and yet we've been taught that somehow we're supposed to be able to. So we suppress. We use other protective patterns to try to protect ourselves, like intellectualization, staying in our head, or distraction with the many, many ways we distract with TV, video games, even though they, those can be valued activities, I'm not judging that. I'm just noticing, looking at the functions of what we've been taught to avoid our own emotions because we're tr supposedly trying to control them. And yet in reality, they're still there. We're just, we're just distancing from our own core emotion. So helplessness, the first truth it's telling us is we can't control anything except our own actions in this one moment. So even though we're helpless to control everything else and it's going to show up a hundred or a thousand times a day, we in this moment are not helpless. We can do a valued action. We can make a choice. So it's telling us that truth, but it also only shows up to tell us the second truth, that we care about something. Otherwise, the helplessness doesn't even show up. It only shows up when it's tied to something we care about. And that is often to clarify what is it we care about often other emotions show up with the helplessness and here grief is showing up to try to help clarify what is it about not being able to see my grandson's face that matters to me the grief is telling me that i held an attachment to an idea that i would want to see my grandchildren's faces i want to see the people in my life that i love um, and we Grief tells us we form attachments to, to people, to things, of course we do, to ideas like hopes and ideas for the future or the future for our children or grandchildren. We attach to all sorts of things. And when life gives us new information or reality, that, that idea is not going to be supported. It is not possible. We need to detach from that attachment and that detaching is grief. And it's it's actually healthy. And it's important for us to understand what it's trying to tell us. It's telling us that we're not in denial. We actually are seeing reality. 
And I value that. That's part of my integrity. So grief is actually telling me it's an aspect of my integrity to face reality, even when it's hard. But in this example, with not being able to see my grandson's face, when I asked the grief, what are you trying to tell me about why this matters to me? What shows up is I don't want to miss a single nuance of my direct experience with him and with all of my loved ones. And so I'll ask, so why do I not want to miss a single nuance? What is that saying? I'm trying to get to the core value of what the grief is telling me. And the core value is I stand for loving, enduring, uh, supportive relationships in my life. That's the core of me. I, I stand for being loving. And when I connect to that deep core value, openings always happen. When I think about, I start to explore, well, this truth is I cannot see his face. I'm going to accept that truth. But the core of this is that I stand for being loving. And there are so many ways, so many ways I can show up in a loving way with my grandson. And at, when we connect to that core value and we start to explore the things we do have control over in this moment, the choice for what I do, that's my control. We can look at other ideas and influences, um, people in literature or movies. What if there's somebody we really liked and resonated with something they did? Well, that means it's, it's core to us and we can claim it. We can look at people in our own lives who are role models or who acted in ways of loving that feel authentic to us. We can, we can explore all these ideas. So for me, what shows up is my own mom who is incredibly loving and supportive. And because she was also experienced blindness, by the time her grandchildren came along, she, um, she already couldn't see them. So when they were born, she just started saying, um, I'm gonna braille your face. Now my mom didn't know braille, but it was her word because we get to name our own words in life. She, that was her name for feeling their face. And as they grew up, she would periodically say, it's been a while, I wanna see how you're growing up and what things are changing, I'm gonna braille your face. And she would feel their face and their hair. And um, so they grew up with this practice. And I have many memories of visiting my parents on the weekend and my nieces, for some reason, love to uh, get ready for school dances or other fancy things at my grandparents. So they bring their dresses and their makeup. Um, and then they'd come out all dressed up and they'd say, OK, Grandma, we're ready for you to braille us. And my mom would, the, she'd, we'd, we'd just hear their giggles and my mom's oohs and ahs and comments as she felt their, their hairdos and their their dresses and their high shoes, and she would express concern that they didn't trip or hurt themselves. Um, I'd hear you know, my niece's voices saying, describing the, the colors of the dresses, and and they were, it, the room was just filled with joy and delight and love. It didn't matter one bit that my mom could not see them, not one bit. So I have those messages. So I can validate the grief. I can ask what it tells me about what I care about. And I can connect to that core value and explore the openings of how would I want to show up? There's so many ways I can show love. So in my the relationship with the man who was my first husband, I'd become pregnant um, and made it through the first trimester. Everything looked great. Two weeks into the second trimester, I experienced a complicated miscarriage followed by a complicated surgery, followed by learning that there was permanent damage and I would never be able to have children of my own. The grief and sorrow and helplessness and despair at that time would, would take a lot of time for me to describe, but I did the same process of of being with those emotions and having compassion for them, checking what are they telling me about what really matters to this. I'd had this idea I was attached to my whole life of being mom, it was so important to me. 
And when I when I got when I finally connected to the core, 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 I realized I stand for nurturing was the word that captured the value the best. Nurturing in relationships with people who are open to that. Um, there are many self-sufficient people who don't really want to feel nurtured. But for people, for me, it means being really supportive, non-judgmental, helping people grow or develop in ways they want to. I just I have very strong maternal instincts. So I found ways to act on that. My nieces and nephews, I was a very devoted Auntie Anne in as many ways as I had control to be. In working at the VA, I work with so many interns, practicum students, psychiatry and psychology residents, and, and that nurturing showed up. And many of them, when they were graduating out of their training, gave me feedback that they always felt safe and secure in our supervision meetings. They felt they could share anything with me and they knew I wouldn't judge them. I would just be with them. And a few even said, you were like my VA mom. It was so meaningful to me to show up in this nurturing way. You know, I, I eventually divorced my first husband because the relationship was just not healthy for me. And about a year later, I began dating Eric, who is the absolute love of my life. And with him came his children. So I got to be a stepmom. And his daughter and her husband completely 100% supported me being grandma to their son, my two-year-old grandson. From, from the time he was born till today, when I'm with him, I ask him, may I braille your face? And I touch his face. And I just, he's got these really plump cheeks. And, <laughs> and he just, and as he's been able to speak and say, yeah, he says, yeah, a lot. Now he answers. Whereas before he just would let me do it because he was a baby. Now he'll say, yeah. And I hold his cheek and he lets, he lets me just hold it there until I remove it. And what a gift. And as I'm doing that, I am connecting so fully with, I'm showing love. I feel connected to my mom. I miss her every day. She died in 2017. And how much she meant to me and how I want to show up. And the grief, even though I would still, of course, love to be able to see his face. I don't, it's not a need. I can show up in these other ways and still be loving. So grief and helplessness are showing and telling me so much about who I am and how I, I want to be. Okay. So the other principle um, that I want to share is from this attachment theory and brief psychodynamic theory is the importance of belongingness for feeling safe and secure in relationships that can help us weather the times of adversity in our lives when we feel emotionally supported, meaning we can show up with our core emotional pain in a way that feels safe and secure. We can feel it fully. It's really can feel overwhelming to feel our own core emotions fully without having knowing that other people care about us. So we're going to have those protective patterns in place if we don't feel safe and secure. We're gonna hang out in our head a bit or the many other ways we have protective patterns. Um, by the way, I name mine Melvin because it helps me look at them. Um, and and be, I have a couple really common self-protective patterns when I'm not feeling that in the moment I can really open to the emotional world. For, for many reasons, there are times we just don't feel safe or secure to do that. One is I, I tend to withdraw like a turtle sometimes, just be quiet with myself. It helps minimize any other stimulation until I'm ready to re-engage. But that is one of my Melvins. And I, I don't mean any disrespect to people named Melvin. It's a fine name. It just helps me look at it in a non-judgmental way. And it, it helps me hold it a little bit lighter. 
another common protective pattern I have is I can get a little fretful, get caught up in my head with the the worries or the planning of things I do have control over um, when I'm not feeling able to be really with maybe helplessness related to something else. So I know those two Melvins are some of my common ones. So we have these patterns and it's really important to not judge them, but to learn to look at them and ask what are they trying to protect us from and how can we seek more secure moments with other people. So the importance for emotional security and safety is when we're sharing a story that includes emotional pain that we feel deeply heard and understood and cared about by the other person. What interferes with that is if people respond with advice we didn't ask for or want, because that distances us. It doesn't feel then that they're really with us. It feels more like they're with their own ideas because they are trying to be helpful. We can totally validate they truly believe they are being helpful and showing caring. But it's the idea that, well, if you just do this, then you won't feel what you feel. And meanwhile, the feelings you're trying to help feel connected with somebody else around, that's not happening. Belongingness and connectedness in our sharings is what helps us heal and integrate the new memories of painful experiences in our life. So having a listener respond with advice is enough helpful unless we're asking for it. Or with some sort of a judgment, like, oh, you shouldn't be feeling what you feel. Eh, that's not really being with us. Um, so any kind of judgments, and sometimes they're even harsher, are certainly not helpful. So learning how to set the frame, like I'll sometimes tell Eric, I need to just share this story of something that just happened, and I just need you to be with. And he knows that just expressing, I'm here with you, I, I'm hearing you some messages that you matter and your emotions matter that's that's kind of what i need in those moments that helps build security and belongingness um and and that's a really important i think principle that is core to me i'm fostering those relationships now people who don't have anybody in their family with vision loss which is usually the case with people with refsum it's so lonely, it's such a rare condition, like one in a million is the estimate. Um, so these communities that this Refsum Global Dare Foundation is trying to build might be such an important resource to have a sense of community. If I could gift you all my family, that fine culture of acceptance and being treated as equal and, and belongingness, I, I wish I would give it to you. Um, but your community and trying to stay connected, I think, might feel really helpful or important. But trust your own core. Your own core self knows what's healthy and healing for you. And I would never want to put a should on, at your feet if it doesn't feel healthy for you. But that's, that's a principle that's important. The third one is this idea from narrative therapy of externalizing and naming what we view maybe as a problem in our life or a challenge. Um, so the naming and externalizing, because we are not the blindness or the vision loss. We are not the ref sum. We are us. We are the human being. The ref sum or the retinitis pigmentosa are conditions and experiences that kind of walk alongside us and they have their influences. Uh, but when we can externalize it and look at it, we can appreciate and notice all the ripples and nuances. Some are painful, some create moments of grief and loss and helplessness, but some create moments of humor and hilarity. Um, I had a, my best friend from college used to come to the cities uh, one weekend a month and we'd go out dancing. And, and because she'd known me all these years, she knew that uh, to guide me, she would reach down for my hand and put it on her elbow because um, that just worked simpler for us. But one time we were out dancing and I was really going, I, I dance kind of all, I'm, I'm all in <laughs> when I dance. I love to dance. And the, the, the band was ending, they're set. And I just reached out enthusiastically for her elbow and realized I was touching a part of her upper anatomy. That was not her elbow. Um, and we both kind of froze 
And, and then we just dissolved in laughter with tears were coming down our eyes. And when we could catch our breath, my friend Shannon said, it's okay, Anne, that's the most action I've had in a year. And, and we again laughed and laughed and we were the only ones on the dance floor and it didn't matter because we were just filled with this joy and delight and laughter that the blindness created that moment. And Eric and I have had many moments like that, but they're not quite as vivid as a story. So we're like, I can't think of a recent story, but I know we've laughed at things because I couldn't see something happened. And we're we're open to those moments and we that's a part of the blindness in my journey with it. And yes, when there are complexities of other limitations, um, which which I've tried to educate myself about refsum with hearing loss, other mobility problems, all these things can create a lot more moments of the grief and loss and the helplessness and the the needs to spend time then with adjustment processes that mean you can't spend time doing things you would much rather be doing. All those things are there. But externalizing and naming each of those parts can actually feel helpful. Um, at least they do for me and for many of the, the patients I worked with at the VA. And for Eric and I, this is where we're gonna talk a little bit about the common dilemmas um, and how we have used this narrative therapy externalization and naming principle to help us navigate those conflicts. They, they haven't stopped showing up because they are going to show up. Do they just help us navigate them um, in, a, in a way that feels where we can still connect to our core values more easily? Before we get to those, though, I would like to just acknowledge that the, the support people in our lives who have vision, um, also experience grief with our progressive loss losses and so i just want to ask eric now i'm just going to ask him to describe what the grief nuances are like for him in a, a partnership with with me yes um they you know it, it, it's a moving target it changes um day by day sometimes i i find myself grieving in different ways it's part of it is just my my empathy for what ann is going through i um i i see her frustration at not being able to see something that she could see somewhat um uh, just recently and and it's hard it's hard to watch someone you loved going through that It's also parts of my experience and the way I like to live my life that I don't get to share as fully with Anne as I would like to share with her. Um, don't get me wrong, a day with Anne is better than a day with anybody else. But there are things about how I experience the world. For example, if I travel, I don't like so much really to travel by myself. I like to travel with someone. Anne's a good sport about it. She's not as keen on traveling because, as you may know, there are many um, unexpected environments and things that you uh, things things are not where you expect them to be when you're traveling, and travel is not as pleasurable, uh, or can be less pleasurable for her. Um, so it's when she does travel with me we're out together, I'll point things out because that's how I experience them. Um, and I'm used to being able to call someone's attention to the thing that I'm looking at. And I, even after being married for nearly 10 years, I find myself still pointing out things for Anne to look at and- Especially birds. He loves pointing out, oh, there's a hawk. Well, or there's an eagle. We're, we're, and, we're, and I love that. We're but... blessed to live in a place with <laughs> eagles and, yeah. and I, and you know i'm old enough that when i was when i was little eagles were something you read about or heard about or or noticed on on your dollar bill or wherever um but you didn't actually see them in nature now every time i see an eagle it's an event and i point it out and i say there's an eagle it's right there it's no it's right right over our heads just look up yeah 
I can't see it. So I'm going to pause. And so with this narrative therapy principles in mind, I'm just going to ask you in that moment, you're connecting to either a beautiful sight on a travel or the eagle. And you have this yearning, you're attached to this, this yearning, this idea of pointing it out to me so I can have the shared experience with you. And then, then the reality is talking to you. I can't share that part. What shows up for you? What do you feel? I feel, I feel helpless. I feel a little, um, I feel like I need to, I need to find ways. It's, it's frustrating. I feel like I need to find a way to share it with you. Um, I need to describe it. I need to, I need to, I, I feel almost like I don't get to have seen something until you've seen it too, you know? Um, so, so, go ahead. so the emotion of helplessness is showing up to tell you the truth. You cannot make me see it. That's not going to happen. And then your mind gives you these other ideas of trying to strengthen or thicken my experience of it in the ways you do have control over so you can describe it to me. And yet there's still this, what's this other part? What would you name it that shows up with the feeling? It's still not what you most yearn for, me seeing it. What's is that? The it's, grief? it's almost like, well, I, do, I don't know. Grief is is kind of a big word for it. It's I feel like I can't really, it's almost like I'm keeping a log of things I see. And until I get you to see it too, I can't verify the stuff that's in my log. You know, I need you to validate my experience. I need you to say, oh my gosh, yes, thank you for pointing that out. That's the, that's the best view of an eagle I've ever had. Yeah. So uh, you want the the yearning I, there is a shared. You really want the shared experience, and it, and where does that? What history uh, of that yearning? What well, shows up? I, I have a sense of where it came from. My my mother was um, a big one for for noticing things and making sure that I could see them. She she sometimes she would grab my head and swivel it like a camera so that she knew that I was looking in the right place to see the thing that she was pointing out. She would take me when I was a boy up to the, up to the, when we were vacationing on the Jersey seashore, she'd take me up to this bench that was at the top of the street on a dune overlooking the ocean. And at that time, this was after electricity was invented. Yes, but it was still pretty dark on the East, on the East coast. And you could look up from the Jersey shore and see a, beautiful starscape and she'd see a shooting star and she'd say there look and I and I would always miss it I would never see it and she was disappointed with me and it was important to her to make me see it and that's what she was doing when she was swiveling my head like that um and I have no trouble to this day maybe that's why um but I remember one time especially there was a really long one uh, uh big meteor that took a long time to burn out and she was able to get my head looking in the right direction to see it and I saw it and it was a big moment for her it was a this moment of celebration and we had shared this this rare and beautiful thing and I'd been able to experience it fully and I think that helped her experience it fully so you feel that the the, the power and the beauty I'm just feeling really touched by the that moment of mother and son and what you took in as an experience of truth and memory that boy when you can really share something that somebody else is excited about and you're both there it's it's a beautiful thing and so now in our day to day that visual sharing is not possible right and the helplessness is show, telling you that truth so i'm going to go a little deeper what what is the helplessness or what other other emotions are showing up with it? If grief is kind of too big of a word, whatever you might name it, but for the sake of time, if it's okay, I'm just going to ask what, what's the value? What are they telling you about what matters to you with me in, in those moments? <laughs> I need you to believe that I saw it. <laughs> oh, I know that's a given of course, but deeper yet, what, what is the emotion? telling you um uh, well uh, about what you care about um it i 
I, I care about being fully with you and you being fully with me. And what does that say? Why is that important to you? What does that say about that core deep, deep value? Well, it reminds me of how much I love you. Yeah. And I want to do everything I can to show up being share, well, loving. Well, yes. And, and to share the world with you. Yeah. So from that core level, where we do have control and openings, do you, would you say that this, this grief or helplessness and all these things that we cannot share because I, yeah. or we can't, I can't right. see, um, that we are at that deep core level that you have found ways to show up and act on those values with me? Mm -hmm. Can you say that a little more emphatically for our <laughs> yes. audience, please? Yeah, well, yeah. I'm, I'm, uh -huh. it's, it's, yeah. it's rather, well, it's, the, it's, um, Yes, it's, he has yes, shown yes, up. I, he yes, showed up incredibly yes, loving. He's the healthiest, most beautiful relationship I've ever been in. And so I, not the most articulate, obviously, but you're uh, fine. I do you're, what I you're can. You're great. And I get to in turn validate his grief moments. And I'm, the more I understand the history with his mom, I feel like there's this beautiful, loving memory of his mom that shows up every time he's saying, look, and I, I can't see it. And then there's this little boy here with the the hurt and frustration himself that he wasn't able to connect with mom and the things she was trying to have him see all those times he wasn't able to connect. But all of those emotions just say how much you stand for loving connectedness in your relationships. Mm -hmm. And there's so many ways you do have control over and the grief is telling you also important things. I can't see, I'm not gonna be able to share that. So then when we come to the dilemmas, the most common dilemmas for a, a person with kind of probably any declining medical condition, but we're talking about kind of vision loss right now. And the, the person in their lives with sight usually boil down to two types. Um, one, the dilemma created when I haven't asked for help and Eric is offering unsolicited help. And in each dilemma, a dilemma is defined as a moment when different values show up and kind of pull us to act, and yet we can only act on one. So there might be some important values, we can only act on one in the moment because we only have control over what we say or do in this one moment, one action. If we're lucky, there's a win-win action to navigate some dilemmas, but in these cases, there really isn't. We act on one or the other. So in that moment, so that's one category, unsolicited offers of help. And the other one is when I ask for help and Eric's busy or he has an attachment to his own ideas of how he wants to use his time. And there I am asking for help and that creates a conflict. So here we're going to break down. And as I talk about the, the values, we're going to, Eric's going to share the stories of how we came up with the names, what we ended up naming these dilemmas. So the dilemma of unsolicited offers of help, in that moment, he has seen something that he thinks, oh, I can be helpful. And my values in that moment, he's offered help. I have a choice. If, I've, if I honor my own value of self-sufficiency, which I do, um, then I would decline the help. And because I can do it myself, that was my plan. But if I have the value of wanting to affirm something that I know is core to Eric, he is built at being a helper. It's just one of his love languages. He just, he likes to be helpful. And if I honor that value and to respect and support that, then I would accept his help. So it's a dilemma, accept it or not. And I have different values that are calling into play. Now on his side, the, seeing me, potentially he, he may view me as struggling with something or just he, he knows I'm about to do something and he wants to be helpful, whatever that is. What are, so his options are to not offer help or to offer it. What would you name the value of offering help? If you say you're thirsty, 
I'm going to get you a glass of water. Yeah. So tell the story of how we came up with that name. Um, it's it's when we were initially trying to navigate the boundaries of, of this problem. Um, and it, it got, for me, it got down to a, a bedrock thing. If I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be on the table when we have a camera there. Um, it's, it's important to me if, if Anne is uh, expressing a, a need or a, or a want, it is just in my nature to say, you know, to offer, offer ideas. Could you take some ibuprofen? Um, could you, uh, I mean, there are, there are things that are not. It's more than just offering ideas. He actually yeah. offers a physical act of helpfulness. And, right. Uh, and sometimes and it's dangerous. If, if Anne is getting into a car or is about to get into a car and I open the door for her without her knowing that I've done that, she's likely to smash her hand into oh, yeah. where the, and I, yeah. yeah. And yeah. this happens. Yeah. So, but I'm, what would you name the value? It's just the core of helplessness. Okay. That would answer that question of what value is being act you're connecting with, with the choice to offer help, but you, you gave the name. Can you right. tell them the story yeah, of well, where that name came from? Well, it, it is, it's literally what, what you think it is. It's, um, I sat down one day, we're on the couch That's and, it. and she, mentioned that she was thirsty. And I was about to get up to get myself a glass of water. And I jumped up and went to get her a glass of water. It's I, I don't think about it. I don't I don't mm -hmm. and I and I I don't apologize for bringing yeah, you of a glass not. of and water. And I'm not judging him yeah. either. That's the important thing when we name the dilemma, whenever you name it and we came up right then like, oh, this is a great name for these moments where he is offering help that I haven't asked for. Um we'll call it when you say you're thirsty and so i i'm just saying that coming up with the name when we say it whether it's he's already offered and i say i know this is a when you say you're thirsty moment i we know we are validating the core of each other but there are all these other times when i can see a way i have learned this that even though i can see a way to help i withhold it Right. And so that's the other part. The second part of when he withholds it, because we've talked about the value of because he does love me. He does want to support my value of self-sufficiency and independence. So what he's the times he withhold it, he is acting on that other value of respecting my autonomy and my independence and that I have a plan because if I haven't asked for the help, I have a plan. Um, so, so the offering help totally core to his value. I'm not going to judge that. Um, I I know it's who he is, and I'll I'll decline it if I if I'm needing to feel like that's important to me to decline it, or I'll accept it. And he can offer it or not. And when he doesn't, when he tries really hard to not offer it, we know that that's hard for him. So we we worked on a name to help him know absolutely that I validate his efforts to be be there for me with my own self-sufficiency. So the name? Help by not helping. Yeah. And and it and sometimes it costs me um, because if I see Anne needing help and I don't help where I come from, that's kind of, that's uh, the opposite of love language. I mean, that's being insulting. That's or being, it's being rude and neglectful um, or selfish or something. And, okay. and, and, and so it gives rise in me to, a, to a thing that is not helpful. Um, but I sometimes do it anyway. I'll say, you know, at this moment, I'm helping by not helping. And I love it when he does that you because do? it, yes, it totally, I, I have no problem with that because I know you, he's naming something that showed up that's really hard for him. And he's verb, he's being transparent with it's, the it's process a, that he is, he is honoring my self-sufficiency and it's really hard for him to not be helpful, to actually not act on it, but he's internalizing and it's taking time. But you've talked about how 
he's starting to really internalize. He truly is helping me by not helping. But we, yeah, the times you name it, like to let me know that that's what you're experiencing, I feel closer because you're sharing something from your core with me. This is what's showing up for me right now. I still want to help. And and I know he's he's standing with me and my self-sufficiency there. I love it. You get to name it. And I'm hearing what shows up for you is this old lifelong programming of to not offer help is somehow being rude or neglectful. But those are ideas. They've been programmed. And all we can do is live in the moment with the truth of this experience is you get to see my response and take it in that it's strengthening our relationship and our, our connectedness and our understanding of each other. And I know you would, you would give your life for me. Well, I know that that's true. Yeah. I know but, that. but even so, if, <laughs> if somebody is sitting there folding, you know, working her way through a pile of laundry, folding clothes, and I'm not offering to help, I feel like a gold brick. I feel like I should be helping. I feel like I should step yeah, up yeah. And, and share that burden. Yep. Those are the shoulds and the ideas. So I'm just going to invite you to be aware. We all have those ideas from whatever programming or past experiences. It doesn't mean it's it's a judgmental programming. It, it could be meaningful experiences in the past that are informing why we want to show up in a certain way. And yet the present moment context and knowing who I am and knowing that you putting your hands in that basket when I don't see them <laughs> would create, we'd be going like this. Yeah, you know, we'd be like, get your hands out of my basket. We sometimes do that. We sometimes we, actually we, have we little this. Yeah, flat plates. Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah. So these see two. these nuances of, of things. And then just quickly, before we move to q and I just want to address the other times where he's busy and I'm asking him for, for help. I, the values there are I need some some someone with vision to help with something um, that's important to me. So the task is important. That's why I ask for help. My other option would be to not ask for help because he's usually got ideas for how he wants to spend his time. Um, and I could support him by not asking for help or just asking him when would be a time where I could ask you for help. His response to this dilemma is I'm asking for help and he's busy. He can either stop what he's doing and support me, which would be the value of loving and being helpful. Or he can say he could ask me to wait because he's he's busy right now and he's attached to getting things done unless it's urgent. And I have assured him his needs and wants are equally important to mine unless it's something urgent. And I can, I'm assertive enough to say this is really time sensitive. These are the risks if we don't attend to it. But his, he, he tends to, because he's so loving, uh, want to divert his needs to address mine. And I don't want the blindness. So I externalize the blindness. I name it blindness moments or the RP. It's walking this journey with me. I don't want that to be a reason why he thinks my needs are more important than his. I want to be treated as a full equal. And so we negotiate the time the best we can. So, but we have words for when I'm coming at him with too many requests at a time. Um, do you want to, we have two well, different names yeah, that are sort of slight. We don't have time to go into the nuances <laughs> of what, how different they are, but we have two names. You want to share? Can I eat my pie? That's one. That's one. And you're crashing my computer. So the crashing my computer is kind of like when I, I'm rapidly, I've just asked him one thing or I've asked him another and he's still mentally trying to figure something out. And it really is too much. And anybody can experience this with partners. So that's right. just our name that, and it immediately lets me know I need to give some space. I need to hold my own thoughts for a bit to give him some breathing room. But can I eat my pie is more of, he he's wanting to finish something he's doing. It's not that he's feeling pressure with multiple requests, but even one request. What's what, his word for saying, just can we wait a little what, bit? One of the nuances here, though, is that you already have pie because I brought you a piece of pie. The, the name came from this moment yeah. where we were having nap snack. We like to take naps and have a little snack afterwards. <laughs> and we were having some pie. 
I had finished mine and I couldn't see that he wasn't done with his and I had asked him to look something up. Perhaps it was I just didn't. starting mine. Taking the first bite. Well, I I didn't see that or know that. So when he said his mouth is full, can I eat my pie? And it was so funny. And I just laughed and laughed and laughed because they were like, I didn't know you weren't done, of course. And we're like, oh, that's a great name for these moments when I'm asking for something. He wants to do something else or even actually finish eating pie. Can I eat my pie? And it it these naming practices and externalizing and the we know when we're using these words, the immediate meaning, if you negotiate them with the people in your lives, the, the deepest meaning is that we love each other. We're in this together. And this is a common dilemma because of who we are and our values. And it's complicated. But this is our preferred. He needs some space and time. I'm going to be responsive to that because he matters to me too. So those are the main concepts. And um, I, I hope they're helpful. But we're going to open to Q&A right now. So thanks very much, um, Anne and Eric. That was um, a really insightful, heartfelt, and authentic presentation that you shared with us today. Um, just uh, for those who are in the audience, if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A box. As I said at the beginning, you don't have the ability to unmute yourselves. You can only ask your question by, by typing it in Q&A. I don't see any questions in the Q&A yet, but uh, Christy and I have a couple of questions to ask you. Okay. So um, um, one of them directed at, at you. So Eric had expressed his desire to, to travel and that you're reluctant to do that um, and because of your vision loss. I mean, how does it make you feel, you know, not being able to fulfill one of his, his desires to travel? Yeah, I, I do want to clarify that. I have actually never expressed reluctance. He says that, <laughs> and, I, and it hurts a little bit, Sorry. to be honest and yeah. authentic. Um, if he says something is important to him and, and he wants to do it, I, we're going to go, we're going to do it. And in fact, I've taken the lead at planning some things because he was thinking I might not enjoy certain things as much. So maybe it's not as important, but I've, I've arranged for the plans. So I, he, he's aware. <laughs> it, it comes up in our conversations that I don't, I, it's an area we're still working on that there are other reasons we don't travel that have nothing to do with my vision or what I'm able to experience or not. It's how we want to prioritize our our savings. Um, mm -hmm. And we just happen to love time at home. Uh, the things that, like he likes to go camping and hiking. I don't like bugs and I have Raynaud's disorder, which means I get chilled easily. And I'm just, I'm just not, that's going to be uncomfortable for me. And so I encourage him to go camping with his friends or, or his son, Peter, who loves to go camping. Um, or I can go for day hikes with him guiding me. And we certainly do that. Uh, yeah. But I'll stay in a hotel, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I, I want to apologize to Anne in front of you and the world and say that, yes, and, and I think I said that she was a good sport about it, but um, that's certainly true. She is a good sport about it, but I also know that <clears throat> it's complicated for her in a way that it's not complicated for me. I can travel more casually, and even though she's explicitly insistent emphatically willing to travel with me it isn't as much of, of a joy for her as it is for me i it's kind of core it's not really about the blindness though i i've traveled to ireland and london when i was 19 years old loved it i had better vision back then obviously eric and i went to norway the year after we got married um and germany and I loved it. Even though I couldn't see what he was seeing, I loved it. Um, so I know we have it in us to do other travels. 
there are actually these other reasons that are more so than my um, blindness that we're, we're not doing that kind of travel. But we love our road trip. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. Um, I, I have another question. It's um, not as personal as the last one, but um, what I've uh, really enjoyed is seeing how you as a couple have, you know, found your way to, to interact with each other and um, you're, you're naming um, things to help, you know, be clear with what's going on um, and that you have humor um, in your in your marriage, which makes things a little easier. But at the beginning, you talked about, you know, how people with RP, um, you know, tend to have um, quite a bit of anxiety and, and depression. And I know within our RefSum community, we do have people who suffer with some, you know, heavy depression. And you talked about, you know, various tools that we can apply, you know, to help us. But um, it seems that some people are able to cope with some of life's challenges better better than others. What would be your recommendation for somebody who is really, you know, grappling um, with coping with the changes that uh, REFSM or any other chronic illness has brought on with them? Yeah, I would, if, if, it, if anxiety, depression, any other mental health concerns are, um, I do think getting connected to any uh, vision loss rehabilitation program because they offer so many helpful strategies and and ways to function and that can that can help somewhat but it is a misassumption that just getting learning how to function daily life uh, with the losses is somehow going to mean you're not going to struggle with anxiety or depression that's a misassumption and many people and uh, people in the rehabilitation services may uh, not be um, validating a need for actual mental health therapy or even medications. These are all tools and allies available uh, to help walk alongside us to buffer the negative effects of stressors in our lives. And adjustment to declining function is a huge chronic stressor and we need a lot of support. And if our natural environment the people and friends in our life are not quite meeting the needs we have for that kind of emotional support to address the anxiety or depression. Um, professional help is so important. And some people are struggling with the stigma about seeking mental health. Again, medical model psychopathologizes it as something bad or abnormal. And yet if we can step out of that narrative and just be with probably the majority of people at some point in their lifetime experience mental health issues or concerns and could benefit from in the in the generations ago in humanity we might call them um, the the elders in our lives or the the shamans or the we go to the experts for the help we need so modern society has therapists psychologists social workers um, psychiatrists whatever the the counselor's name might be or profession they are are the experts that are here to help us um to whether it's to learn skills some people really find it beneficial to learn certain strategies or skills or ideas but for many it's finding a therapist who truly listens to offer that belongingness and connectedness to feel deeply heard and understood by just even one person can help us integrate to take that feel that relief of feeling like our painful the stories of the losses or whatever feels heavy or the anxieties can be internalized. So I, I recommend if it if if you think you might benefit from therapy, uh, yeah, seek it out. But but seek out. Feel free to be an advocate to find a therapist who feels like a good fit for you. Um, ask what kind of approach they take. Do they have experience working with people with declining physical functioning? Uh, often therapists trained to work with um, older adults like gerontologists or uh, geriatric providers kind of have a sense and understand about this complex grief that happens with declining functioning. Um, if, if they've ever worked or if they know people with low vision, you know, just to have, see if they have a sense of the blind world at all. But even if they don't, my therapist in grad school had no such experience 
I was his first and he was wonderful because he was a deep listener and he just listened to what mattered to me and to the areas I was struggling with and validated my hurt and loneliness when I wasn't going out with my friends because it just wasn't fun for me and my choice to not go to something not fun um, and extremely stressful and that felt excluded. Um, but I started to ask, we came up with ideas. I could ask them to come over to my house for some group activities where it wasn't too noisy um, and we could have drinks at my place. So I was able to come up with ideas to have some shared group activities to feel not excluded. So those kind of ideas of just being with me. So a therapist who's with and understands and gets to the core with you of what are those core values? How can you act on them? Um, so seeking therapies is, is, I think, um, I, I just highly recommend it. Um, and, mm -hmm. And I had another thought and I, I lost it, um, but go camping. A, yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's important. I think to ask a new therapist, you know, what, if, if they can accommodate your preferred modality, like, do you want in person? Would you rather be over the phone or through the computer with like the telehealth kind of sessions? Um, if they practice a model of therapy, you know, what's their rationale? And if that resonates with you or not, if their if their model of therapy involves worksheets, that's really hard. Often, it, well, it's hard for me. I have screen reading programs on my computer, but they are always there's a lot of glitches and a lot of things aren't fully accessible, and it just becomes yet another thing that feels like a barrier excluding. So, if yeah. I was working with a therapist requiring me to read something or a worksheet, I would say. I want to review it verbally together in session. Okay, I don't want that extra burden of having to figure it out on my own, you know. So those are just honor your own voice and your own agency. And um, I may even want a sighted person with me in the session if that helps me feel comfortable to engage because what if I don't know that therapist very well? I can't see what they're doing. Just that comfort of knowing there's somebody there. And then if there's something really private, we want to process, I can ask the sighted helper to step out. All those things we get to ask for what we need and to trust our core to guide, to guide that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Good, good points. And thank you for that answer. And uh, the anxiety and depression from the psychodynamic perspective or some of the theories, um, actually can consider them not at all like a disorder or psychopathology at all, but but as one of those adaptive protectors that I was talking about before, like I have my Melvins. So depression can show up actually initially as a protection. If we're dealing with a lot of hopes that reality is now showing is not going to happen, at least not the way we had attached to ideas, and we're dealing with all sorts of grief and helplessness. Depression often includes an element of apathy where you start to not care. Well, that can be adaptive. We're caring about things that we can't control, can feel so overwhelming. It's like too much. The apathy could be a self protector, the depression to try to help distance from all of that pain because it's too much. It's too big or we don't have enough of a support system to talk it through or to feel like we can fully experience it so we can validate with respect that depression might be one of those adaptive protectors to give the experience of apathy of not caring even though our core of course does care and um and then unfortunately when depression grabs hold it changes the neurotransmitters in our brain and then it tends to feed itself and it can get more and more severe. So it's really important either way, whether it's a protective defense or not, to seek seek help because I just don't want us to judge and to, to pathologize something that might actually be trying to be helpful. But then when you can look at the different pushes and pulls of the apathy or the depression symptoms, and you can decide, is that, does that feel helpful right now or not? Or does, is there a part of it you wanna keep or a part of it you don't wanna keep? How would you want to stand against that particular push or pull? But just, just recognizing um, 
it, it can be actually trying to be helpful in some way. Anxiety, similar, if it's chronic, chances are it's an, one of those adaptive protective patterns to avoid something more painful that we're not feeling safe or secure that we can experience. So we may get caught up with a lot of worries. So like generalized anxiety disorder could actually be one of these self-protective patterns where we're pulled into the worrying about the future. Well, what if this, or what if that, or, oh my gosh, this could happen, this could happen. When we're all up in our head with all that, and it's creating an energy in our body as if we're about to do something, because that's what anxiety does. We get kind of, <coughs> excuse me, kind of riled up <coughs> as if we're about to do something. So it can kind of distance us or, or suppress like the core emotions of helplessness or other other pain from something from the past. <coughs> I swallowed funny. Okay, so right. staying in our head with all the worry thoughts, that's a, that's a pattern. And mm -hmm. it's functioning to avoid the core, potentially the core pain because we're not feeling safe or secure to connect with that. So when we can, with a therapist, kind of look at what are the patterns showing up? What is the mind pulling you to do or to be where? Is that preferred? Is it not? What's it trying to help with? What's it doing? Um, you know, what's your position on that? Do you approve of it or not? These are all kind of narrative therapy type approaches. Um, and and I happen to love narrative therapy because it's always person-centered. It's always your voice, your agency, what matters to you. Um, absolutely love it. And I love AEDP um, and ACT, which is a valued focus. It's about your own values is a really a great model. But there, but there are many that people might resonate with. Okay. <laughs> I can go on and on. Yeah. Does yeah. that make sense how I described it? The, that the anxiety and depression may be trying to be helpful. It, it, it makes sense. And, and, and I agree, you know, that um, anybody with um, anxiety or depression should be seeking professional yes. help. Yeah. Yes. For sure. Yeah. Um, Eric, maybe a, another question for you. Um, I'd be interested to know what, from your perspective, has been the hardest thing to learn about um, ANS RP. Um, well, that, uh, that is progressive, mm. that, um, that things, and I think, as I mentioned earlier, the things that she can't see today are things that maybe a year ago she could see. <clears throat> yeah. And that, and that her. There, there are times now that I don't remember so much from early on uh, that she is reaching for something and she can't find it, you know, on the table or somewhere. Uh, she'll reach for a glass of water or, or a, um, a glass of anything and and it's not quite where she thought it was. And so she has to kind of grope around the table for it. That's difficult to watch. And yeah. and my impulse, of course, is is to take the, gl the glass and and put it right in front of her and, and make a little noise. You know, I set things down loudly uh, to try to orient her to where where it is. And. And again, that's helping without I mean, that's that's helping without being asked for help. And I don't know. The extent to which I might actually be um not helping you know that's that's kind of that's kind of difficult um what it what have you noticed though when i drop something and i'm feeling around for it um that oh uh, and it's amazing it is absolutely <laughs> unbelievable how Anne has this this internal she's like a bat she can kind of see where she can she she approaches a thing without touching it. She'll, she'll feel to a quarter inch to the right of it, a quarter inch to the left of it, and, and right over it, and right up to the, 
face of it without ever touching it. I miss it. She and I have no it. idea why. I have no sense of location it's or where the sound actually landed. Just incredible. I'm feeling, and I think I'm feeling like I'm covering the grid really well. And he'll just start laughing and he'll say, once again, it was right there and you missed There's it. There's this force field. I keep missing it. And I don't know what that's about, but, and we just laugh. We just laugh because yeah, I've got, <sighs> so. Um, anyway. But, you know, in, in some ways it's actually, um, well, you know what? I think it takes a lot of the dynamic that would occur in any marriage and makes it a little more vivid. Um, there are problems that can be kind of theoretical for us or, or for any couple that are really practical for us. Um, the, the ways in which we need to be clear in our communication with each other probably are true for any married couple that mm -hmm. they should be clear. Mm -hmm. It come up as often, or it's easier to be more, uh, uh, more implicit about some things that maybe you should, all, maybe everybody should be as explicit as we need to be. Um, who knows? Sometimes, frankly, if I'm having a bad hair day, I'm kind of grateful that she can't get a good look at me. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, there's so, there's always, you know, the, the flip side of things, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, listen, um, we're coming up to the end of our time, and I don't any further questions um, from the audience so uh, we'll end off here Can um, I, and, I yeah, do just ahead. want to say, say one thing speaking of our explicit communication I'm aware I, as I think back of our, our time when when we were doing the talking about the dilemmas and I could tell you wanted to say something and I noticed this sense of a uh, of, of fear of running out of time and I, I went like that. I, I did something I actually don't really approve of. I kind of cut you off and I even, I think, put my hand up. And I just want to apologize for that because that's, but, and I'm aware what my younger self from 15 minutes ago when I did it was, was worrying about the time and wanting to get through ideas I was attached to getting through. But I don't ever want that to, to interfere with, with how I want to be with you. Okay. So I'm, I, I thought I'd take this opportunity to kind of model the explicit communication we try to do um, mm -hmm. when I had the opportunity with, with you still here, because I, I am sorry about that. No need to apologize, but thank you. Okay. Okay. No, it's, it's, it's interesting to see your, your dynamics in, in action and, um, I think you've given us some valuable tools and, and perspectives that we can think about and go away with and try to apply them to our own lives. I think this has been um, you know, a very interesting presentation. And Eric, your personal insights um, have added also some meaningful layers to, to the discussion. Um, reminding us, of course, that you're in a partnership and um, you know there's both your individual um, needs and expectations as well as the spouses with or without limitations that need to be taken into consideration. So, I mean, we're incredibly grateful for the, the time and the knowledge that you've spent with us today and, and, and shared with us. I'd um, also like to thank the participants for joining us today. Um, thank you. And again, um, think about the, the remaining webinars that are available to you during the, the rest of the week. And 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 Eric, um, thank you for for being yourselves and and being with us today. Thank you. Well, that ends today's presentation. I wish everyone a, a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.